All right, welcome everybody to the February 3rd Hyperledger TSE call. Uh, as you are probably all aware, uh, there are two things that you must abide by on this call. The first one is the antitrust policy notice, which is currently displayed on the screen. And the second one is our code of conduct, uh, which is linked in the agenda. Um, just don't be a jerk. Um, and everybody is welcome here and able to participate. So welcome to our guests uh, that I see on the call uh, who are not TSC members. You are also welcome to participate and provide your thoughts and feedback as well. Uh, so we have two announcements or two official announcements, maybe some other announcements will come out of this, but the first one is one that we see every week. The Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have anything uh, related to your project, your SIG, your working group, uh, anything that's going on in the community that you think would be of interest to our Hyperledger developers, uh, please consider uh, clicking on that link there and adding a comment on the wiki page uh, to be included in that newsletter. The second one, um, last week, Min talked about the 2022 mentorship program. Uh, the call for mentors and projects has been initiated as of February 1st, I think it was. Um, so if you have a project proposal that you would like to consider having um, brought to the TSC for consideration, please submit a project proposal. There is uh, timeline information that's available for you to take a look at as well as uh, different guidelines for you for submitting the proposal. Um, really great program, obviously. Uh, been very successful in the past year, so uh, please consider doing that. I have seen a few chats going on in our chats with different projects, considering already what sort of projects they'd like to bring forth, so that's really good news. So those are the official announcements. I'd like to see if there's anybody on the call who has an announcement that they would like to make to the TSC. All right, seeing no hands, seeing nobody coming off mute, I will take that as a no. Uh, we do have two quarterly reports that have been submitted. Uh, the Explorer report has been submitted from last year, uh, Q4. So uh, please have a look at that. I saw this morning, I think there were only five people who have had a chance to look at that so far. Um, so please go ahead and take a look at that. The Sawtooth report came in last week, but it came in, I think, on Wednesday, so I left it on the, the list for this week uh, in case any sort of questions came up. Um, but I just have to know whether or not anybody has any questions about Explore or Sawtooth, um, any sort of discussion we would like to have related to those reports. All right, again, seeing no hands, seeing nobody come off mute, I'm gonna take that as no. I will note um, for those of you who have not looked at the Explorer report yet, um, they did mention that they are struggling uh, with project help and are looking for um, more people to come in and contribute to that project. Uh, and I saw David, I think you had commented about ways that they might uh, work with you to, to get more contributors involved. Uh, so much appreciated there for that call out. Yeah, Daniela. Hey, um, I just wanted to let everyone know, you know, as this is a, a, a project, we have reached out to the original contributing company um, who had said that they would, you know, like to assist as well. So we'll be putting a plan together to uh, bring that back to the Explorer project. Okay, great. Thanks, Daniela. All right. Um, so yeah, other than that, we have Aries and Indy uh, that we're looking to get project reports from. We're also looking uh, next week for the Aroha report to come in. I did include uh, Burrow on the list, even though it's dormant. I think you know some of our discussion here today um, around what we will do with dormant projects is is maybe. Uh, a interesting conversation and 
Uh, but I do think it's worthwhile to for us to remember that these dormant projects still are on the uh, the calendar for providing TSC project updates. All right, so let's get into the meat of the meeting and let's talk about uh, first the project life cycle discussion. There's two items here that I want to talk about um, that I think Rai, you brought up to us, which I think are good uh, discussions to have as a TSC. So let's start with the deprecated versus end of life for Avalon. Um, I think if you look at our project life cycle, you will see that deprecated projects are projects that um, are expecting to have people maintaining that for at least another six months. Um, and as we all know, Avalon has uh, stopped supporting that, uh, I think maybe almost a year ago. So I think the, the question here is, should we have sent Avalon directly to end of life instead of uh, putting it through the deprecated stage first uh, and then waiting six months before we end of life it? Dano? So one of my questions is where did we get that it was uh, stopped working on over a year ago because the Q2 and Q1 Hyperledger Avalon reports, the first words on project health for Avalon is healthy. I mean, why should we not believe um, the maintainers when they submit a report like that? And the Q2 was submitted in June. So the earliest that things could have not been functional, I would say is June because they made a claim it was healthy. Um, so, you know, to, to, to operate as if they've been non-functional since March, you know, we don't have eyes in there to, to say otherwise. It's based off of Intel's pulling out, but the other non-Intel contributors were saying, we're gonna make a go for it. And they decided in the end not to and go to confidential compute consortium, but. Yeah, it's a, it is a good um, question about the health, I guess, of Avalon, right? Um, if we look at kind of the statistics, I guess they've had three contributors in the past year, uh, one active contributor in the last month as of February 1st. I'm sorry, the last six months as of February 1st. Um, so I think that's maybe where the, the year is coming from. It's just a small number of commits that have been happening. Um, but yes, you're exactly right. If the project is telling us they're all good, um, we cannot do anything to help them or to um, expect that those are different. And I think that's maybe part of our second discussion is to, to really talk about how do we get analytics and information that will help us understand the state of projects other than the project reports. When I uh, said this earlier, I will admit that I was looking primarily at uh, commit history and PR uh, comments, stuff like that activity in GitHub. I did not look at the quarterly reports. So my assertion around the end of activity could very well be wrong. Perhaps they were active in some other form. Other thoughts on this particular topic? Are we okay with having a project that's in a deprecated state that is not getting any support whatsoever? Part? I mean, Tracy, I totally agree with you that by the definition, Avalon should be end of life and not deprecated. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the, the key here, right? Is just looking at what we've written in the past for our project life cycle. Um, and I think the other piece of this is that according to the, the graph at the top, we can go directly from incubation to end of life. Um, there's, there's nothing that says we have to go through a deprecated phase first.
Any other thoughts on this? Is there anybody who's against moving this to end of life? I don't know, I saw you came off here. Yeah, so I'm not against it. I just, you know, to, to in some ways I feel like, yeah, okay, it, there's not much harm in keeping it where it is now for a bit longer, but you know, it, it, if anything, it, you know, it provides an opportunity for anybody else to come back and say, hey, no, I want to resurrect it. But I think the likelihood in practice is very low. So I am fine either way. Okay, Nathan? I would just point out that this is a case where it's more important to be patient than it is to be correct. Um, just like Arno said, I, it, there's no harm in it being where it is now. If we feel like we need to move it, I don't think there's any harm in that either. Um, I, but I also don't think we have to be in a hurry to do it necessarily, as long as we don't forget to do it. Yeah, definitely. Somebody needs to put a reminder on their calendar for six months from now. <laughs> um, I suppose what, one reason to move it would be if we were in a situation where there are people actually using it and they have problems, they raise issues, and nobody is there to respond to any of this, right? Then it, it becomes really a problem, and and you know we are better off signaling <laughs> to the community don't expect any maintenance. And I think you have to go to end of life for that. But, you know, uh, otherwise it doesn't seem to be the case right now. So either way. Yeah, I, I did just open up the uh, GitHub issues. The last issue that was reported was on November 16th, 2021. Um, the one prior to that, July 22nd, 2021. Um, and there's 42 issues total that are open. Um, there are actually 22 pull requests that are also open. Um, the last one being from October 29th of 2021 uh, and a number of uh, pull requests from before then. Um, so, you know, I, I guess there are people still looking at this as at least as of November, um, if they're opening issues against it, but, uh, you know, I don't know that it's like an issue every day or something like that. That's yeah, no, but I of... think it's. Yeah, I'm glad you actually thought about looking into it because that I actually is you know puts us in that situation that I will I would be worried about where yeah. people expect more than they should <laughs> because we actually know nobody's going to deal with those PRs and, and issues. So then mm -hmm. we are better off moving it sooner rather than later so that the committee knows they can't expect anything to happen. Right. Um, Dano, I think you were first as far as raising hand. So if it's guilt that exists to cut a release, if it's being maintained right now, I mean, maintained by the community implies that if there's a critical bug fix that someone could patch it and push it out if it was critical. Right. That uh, the what you just touched on was uh, my whole interest. The the whole reason that this this you know came to me to that we need to deal with this was that there were a bunch of issues that were opened and unaddressed. Um, Intel's or the 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 previous maintainers were pretty clear that they're not going to do anything about it. They don't have the time or the focus on that project. There were a bunch of PRs that hadn't been, you know, uh, looked at at all, uh, and it just it feels like a dead end for contributions. So I, I just the signaling of, you know, hey, here's a thing that you might be able to use when in fact, you know, the the development effort has moved on to the CCC. Uh, I, I just think it's 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 poor form, but. That was, that was my primary interest in it, was not having a dead end to contributors. Arun? Sure, so I probably wanted to just read, I mean, uh, read through the deprecated state, right? So we are claiming that project, even though it's deprecated, we still have support from the community 
for at least six months from then. And it the support could be in, I, I guess we haven't defined what the support should be. Um, but if we are not getting that, then I'm in favor of moving away from deprecated. Yeah, and if I may add to this, I mean, the, the the composer project, right, went through this phase, but we had people still committed to, you know, dealing with this kind of PRs and issues. And they say, we're not going to make any further development, don't expect any movement, but, you know, we're here still. And so that is a different situation. Here, if we really have people, you know, nobody's going to respond to any of those then I think we, we are doing a disservice to the community by keeping it in the current stage or state. So that has now convinced me that the right thing is to actually move it to end of life ASAP. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think that's what I, I was calling out specifically thinking when I brought this up, reading through the deprecated, it does say a deprecated project will be maintained for a six month period by its community after which it will be removed from any subsequent formal releases. Um, so I think that's the, to me, that's the key, right? That it will be maintained for six months. And I know that it's not going to be maintained for six months at this point, based on the discussions that we've had. So. Okay. Um, so I'll ask again now after this discussion, does anybody have a problem if we move this to end of life? Heart, you came off mute. I was just going to make a motion. Okay. Yeah. We got Happy one motion. All right. No, I was going to second it. Um, right. Do you just want to run us through a, a yay, nay vote? Sure thing. I will, uh, I'll pick uh, by the length of your name in unit now. Okay. Troy, should, uh, sorry, the motion is to move the Avalon project to end of life, correct? That's correct. Troy, how do you vote? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Peter? Yes. Nathan? Yes. Kamalesh? Yes. Uh, Jim is not here. Hart? Yes. Grace? Yes. David? Yes. Dano? Yes. Bobby? Yes. Arun? Yes. Artem is not here. Arno? Yes. Angelo? Yes. Well, the, the motion passes. All right. Thanks, everyone, um, for that. I didn't know we were actually going to have a decision or a vote on that, but I'm glad that we did. Um, so, Arun, any question? Right. I still want to keep one question open that we should have identified the project to enter into dormant. And probably that's an area to focus on in project reports. I guess there is also a discussion that uh, that's currently happening by uh, between Dano and Hart on the chat channel as well on the same topic. Okay, I haven't been paying attention to the chat channel. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I do think that this question of dormant state and what do we do with projects who are not reporting um, is still it's still an open issue in our backlog. Uh, I think you know we hadn't necessarily come to any sort of decision or. Uh, direction on that uh, other than to uh, maybe take a step back for a moment and, and think some more about it before we, we made any radical decisions. Um, patience, I guess, as Nathan says, is, is kind of the direction that we were uh, going to take for the time being. But I do think it's an important sort of discussion for us to have. Um, as long as, you know, I, I, and I guess the that follows on to this question of uh, the second question that I have related to the project life cycle that Rai brought to us, which is once a project moves to dormant, how long should it stay there before uh, we consider moving it to 
uh, deprecated slash end of life type state. Because I think the, the challenge that we have right now, and, and one of the reasons that I did leave Bro on the upcoming reports, uh, even though it's dormant, is that if a project truly is dormant and nobody's looking at it, um, it's hard to know what we should do with it. Do we ever plan on coming out of that dormant stage or um, is it really that the project kind of went to an end of life state and uh, is using dormant as a way of getting around the end of life state? Um, not necessarily on purpose, but because it seemed to make sense at the time and then it just never comes back up around to, to have a further discussion. So Hart. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. So I think the ideal way to use dormant state is to say something like, okay, you know, we're shutting down this project. We know many of you, you know, we know there are a lot of external dependencies on this project, right? You know, now's the time to switch, to find something to switch to, right? To either like take the parts of the code you need to incorporate them into your project or to move to a different project, right? So I don't know that we want to define the the amount of time a project should be in the dormant state because in sort of the like right way that this plays out, um, it the the dormant state is is dependent on sort of how long the maintainers of the project in the dormant state are willing to push critical fixes, and how long it takes people that are dependent on the dormant project to to move and eliminate dependencies on the dormant project. One of the nice things we have about Avalon is that there don't appear to be a lot of uh, systems, at least production systems or, or high value things that depend on Avalon. Um, so it's not a huge deal if production stops, but if, if sort of, sort of uh, if work stopped on, you know, some of the more popular projects in Hyperledger, I think it would be a much more tricky conversation. I hope that made sense. Yeah, and just to, uh, Dan, before I call on you, just to, to comment on that quickly, um, one of the one of the projects, we have two projects in dormant state right now. One is Quilt and one is Burrow. Um, if you look at the, the project reports, um, not the, the TSC quarterly reports, but the project reports that um, Rai has provided for us, you can see that there has been zero commits in the last six months and only one in the last year. Um, and so, you know, at what point do we say like quilt maintainers, even though you went away, how do you come back to us and tell us what, what what's going on, right? There's, there's no way to revisit that, I don't think at this point. Dano? So I view the difference between um, the dormant state and the deprecated state is that dormant is kind of a reversible deprecation. And it's, you know, the, the project saying we may come back and by the way, maintainers want it. If someone wants to take it over, please take it over. That would be an option. But when I see deprecated, you know, I see this is a project that won't be coming back. And it's not, you know, it's not just, you know, a suggestion that you find things to get off. It's like practically a requirement. You need to get off because it's, it's going to end and, so I view, you know, the deprecated as a one-way and dormant is a two-way if, you know, they can fix their governance or if, if it's a um, commitment issue, if they can get out of the time that they need to, to commit to it properly, or if someone else wants to come in and um, provide assistance. So that's, when I see these two, I, that's the two things that run through my mind as, as far as the way it's set up. So that may figure into our decision on when we move it to deprecate EOL for the dormant, if like nobody's stepping up, um, after, you know, rather than a fixed period, if we could, you know, at some point, but they do need to get out of dormant, they can't stay there perpetually. Right. Nathan? I think it's important for us to emphasize that it's not healthy for them to stay in it perpetually. If they insisted that it was the right place for them to be, and they're still active, active enough to respond to our questions about them still being in dormant in a way that's helpful to them. I don't know that we actually have an abuse problem there be so long as they're still active enough that dormant is true. Um, and then it's a review step for us to make sure as the TSC that you know we, we're helping them either leave dormant or, or come to that conclusion that they need to finally let go. Um, 
I, a lot of these states are self-fulfilling prophecies in some ways, meaning, you know, if they're dormant, people who might contribute or who might help come and say, oh, but this is dormant and I'm not really prepared to take on the whole project, I'm going to move on. And it creates critical mass elsewhere. Um, and part of what we want with telling the truth in these states is that the critical mass can stay at Hyperledger in one way or another to help our overall development of our mission. So um, if being dormant helps them to do that, then I think we would rather keep a project dormant than just you know, dismiss the maintainer's wishes. Um, so I, I think it, we need to be careful we don't make the states so rigid that we, we are shoving the maintainers along to say, you've got to be here or you've got to be there. I think we, we always wanted this project status to be a tool to help the maintainers to get the things that they need most. And um, if Burrow stays in dormant for much longer, <clears throat> what they need most is probably to move on from dormant. Um, and that's a conversation we'll want to have with them as we bring up the status in, a, in our regular cadence. Yeah, I, I think that we don't necessarily have that regular cadence uh, because I don't think we made it clear for the projects quilt and burrow entering the dormant state what the responsibilities actually are. Um, and I think that's my biggest concern at this point. Arno? So I just wanted to share, I mean, I actually attended the Eero uh, uh, community call. It was part of, you know, uh, fulfilling my duty as a mm -hmm. member that I need to check on other projects. <laughs> so I did it before the end of the month. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can tap me on the back. Uh, no, but so the, the thing is, it was actually interesting because they were talking about the fact that they are actually using Borough and they were not aware that Borough has actually moved out of you know incubation state into dormant. So I informed them of that. And I said, you probably need to figure out what that means for you. And I imagine one possibility is for them to say, okay, we're going to take over the part that we use, right? I, and so I don't know what that means exactly in terms of the question at hand, but I wanted to share this because I, this is not something that we have faced before where there's a project that moving out of, you know, uh, active status, so to speak, and and they are actually dependencies. So it's going to impact other projects. In this case, you know, Iroha uses it, <laughs> and they were a bit shocked. They were like, "Oh, thanks for telling us." <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's interesting, right? Because I think. It goes the opposite way too, uh, which is did people, did other people know that Aroha was using um, Burl, right? Like Burl, Aroha didn't know that Burl went to dormant, but did people know that Aroha was using Burl? Until you said that, I don't know, I didn't know that. Um, so I think I didn't know either. Of, <laughs> I think there's a, a lot of dependencies maybe out there that we, we are not aware of, um, that we probably should be aware of as we, as we go through and, and think about this. Um, so, and in passing, just to highlight, it shows the fact that I didn't know you didn't know, I, you know, it shows the value of actually, you know, having a look at what's going on in these other projects, just like we had decided. Yes, gold star for Arno. Uh, he wants his gold <laughs> I didn't star. need to brag about it, but <laughs> no, I, <it's> okay. you <laughs> know, <laughs> I thought it was it's actually interesting. Um, Dano, your hand is still up. I don't know if that's because you have something or if it just hasn't gone down yet. Okay, thank you. Um, same for you, Arno, your hand is still up. Um, so, yeah, I, I, to me, I think the, the key here, right, is how do we, how do we stay involved um, with the projects that have gone dormant to ensure that we understand what state actually makes sense for them. Um, and I don't think we've run across this yet. Uh, I think we had Quilt as a project update that was that came due. Uh, I think we ended up removing it from the agenda because we were like, well, it's dormant. We probably won't expect an update from them. So we removed it. 
I guess my question is, should we have done that or should we have tried to reach out to the, the quilt folks to see kind of what their state is? Um, and obviously this question is gonna come up for Burrow. I think Burrow obviously just let us know about that. So maybe it's not as critical with Burrow at this point to have that follow-up conversation of, hey, are you still in dormant or, um, or does it make sense to, to think about a different state? But I'd like to make sure that we, we are having those follow-up conversations with the, the maintainers of the projects that are in dormant. Peter? What if we uh, decided on one member of the TSC being a liaison and something like this happens? It wouldn't be always the same person, but someone could volunteer. And then uh, when, when something like this comes up and a project uh, starts struggling, then we would assign somebody to, to have an open communication channel with them so that we are in the know as it happens. And then uh, you're not just uh, sort of trying to piece together the picture based on the quarterly reports themselves and when was the last commit, when was the last issue, et cetera. Because ultimately, yeah. I think if, sorry, I, I think it makes a huge difference of what they say and what they believe. There's a huge difference because maybe there hasn't been a commit for six months, but if they say, yeah, we were out for six months, but now we're back full swing. That's very different from them saying, yeah, we were out for six months. And honestly, uh, we feel like this is how it's going to be from now on. Yeah, I like I like the idea, Peter, of, uh, you know, do we want to assign liaisons to projects that seem like they're struggling projects that have gone into dormant, um, which would like the question of should we be assigning a liaison for the explorer group um you know to work with obviously the staff that's doing a lot of work already around that um but also with the the folks who are currently listed as maintainers of the explorer project Hart. thanks tracy um i also don't know that we need to you know it may not be the case that sort of going to through dormant may be default. My view on this is sort of that dormant is the route for projects that sort of want to have a planned or graceful obsolescence. And if you know the maintainers just sort of disappear, we can just go ahead and move the project to end of life. Um, because that's more indicative of the fact that the project isn't going to be supported at all. Yeah, I just I decided I maybe when you said that it would be good to read what dormant state was when we decided to introduce this state. Um, so projects in the dormant state are ones in which the normal functions are suspended or slowed down for a period of time. Uh, the TSC will make the decision whether a project will move to or from dormant state upon request. If dormant projects become reactivated, they will re-enter incubation, even if they uh, enter dormant from the graduated state. We don't really say what happens when they're not going to be reactivated, right? Or um, what that period of time is that we expect them to, to be slowed down or suspended. And I think, you know, maybe that's a, that was bad on us to, to not be very clear about that. Um, but I do think now that we have these examples, maybe it's it's time for us to revisit kind of what what that period of time is that we expect things to be dormant so that we can then make better decisions about what to do with these projects, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think maybe there's some work that we can do around this particular state as well as uh, having discussions with both the, the borough and the quilt folks to see kind of what their expectations are for the dormant state. So if I may, the, I don't think we should have a like hard limit saying, you know, after six months, if a project is in dormant state, we move them uh, to deprecated or end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, what we could say is as a kind of, you know, 
we, we could have a, a policy that says, you know, after six months, we will, have, we will check on the status. And that would imply to me that we are somebody at least, you know, as a communication with the maintainers of the project, say, hey, what's the status? Should we still keep that in dormant state? Do you still think you will come back or should we move it? And then in the case where nobody answers, well, that's an answer in and of itself. We can make a decision based on that. But if, you know, we, I, I think there is, some, there is some value in keeping it flexible because we might have somebody who has a very specific thing where they say, hey, for the next three months, we are busy on something else, but we'll be back for sure. And we should allow that. And, and so I, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't favor having a hard limit in, built into this. I, I do think we should have a policy that says after some month time, you know, some amount of uh, months, we, we make the point of reaching out to the maintainer and check on the status. Yeah, I, I agree, Arno. And I think everybody, at least from what I've heard, is probably in agreement with that as well. I didn't hear anybody say like, I oh, know we should be shutting these guys down right now, right? Um, I do think though that as a next step for this discussion, it probably is important for us to reach out to the quilt uh, folks and find out kind of where they're at. Uh, yeah. Just make sure they're they're still, you know, good with dormant. Um, that they expect to to still come back and spend some time on this, or or what the right uh, next steps are for them. Okay. Any other thoughts on this topic? Um, I think you know, um, I can take the action item to reach out to Quilt uh, and and find out what's going on. Uh, with their project and, and hopefully report back. All right, seeing no uh, hands, I will um, move us on to the next section, uh, which are these project reports that I'd like to thank Rai for taking the time to provide a GitHub action um, to run the uh, Hyperledger Community Management Tools Project Reports uh, code. Um, so yeah, definitely let's take a look at these these project reports, Rai. Um, and uh, I think the the question that I have really is, do we find the information in this these sorts of reports useful? Uh, do we want to run these on a regular basis such that we can uh, have additional information um, in addition to the quarterly reports that the uh, projects are providing to us, or um, you know, are these something that we don't think are, are really that useful for us? Still building, right? Yeah, I know. I'm. I, I have a copy of it on my machine. I'm just trying to find where exactly I dropped the thing. Uh, while you're looking for that, Jim, your hand is up. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Tracy. Um, uh, just uh, trying to understand the, the reports, they are based on the insights uh, dimensions, is that correct? Just making that static? Uh, so not really. Um, so what they are, are they use the GitHub APIs to provide, to pull information specifically from GitHub about the contributions that have been made uh, to a particular project. Um, in this case, the, the one that's being shown is a Hyperledger Aries report, looking at uh, a, a number of different sorts of things around the project, such as uh, the total contributors for the life of the project, the contributors that have existed for the past year, uh, the number of active contributors, which are contributors in the, who've made at least one contribution in the past six months. Um, how many, obviously like it's 259 minus 81, I hope is 178. Those are the inactive contributors. Uh, the new contributors are contributors who um, made their first contribution in the past month. 
Um, so in the case of Aries, there was one new contributor this past month. Uh, repeat contributors, people have had more than um, one contribution for the life of the project. Core contributors are those who have contributed 80% of the code. Um, so there's actually 28 core contributors or 10% of the con total contributors who um, have contributed the 80% of the code. Uh, regular contributors are those who contributed 95% of the code. Obviously, those are the core contributors plus some additional uh, folks. Then you've got the casual contributors, um, which I don't know what the, the footnote says, but uh, those are people who, um, number six, the regular contributors have contributed 95, I'm sorry, casual contributors must be the 5%, the other 5%. Um, and then just some, some information that takes those numbers and divides them apart to try and figure out, you know, what the retention rate of contributors is, the level of engagement being, um, you know, how many people have done repeat contributions. And then just the specific details behind each of those kind of numbers, that summary. So, you know, if you look at this for Aries, Aries looks pretty healthy, right? They've got 81 active contributors in the last six months. Um, they're still getting new contributors. They have, uh, you know, not out of all of their contributors, only 10% are core contributors, which seems pretty good because that means um, there's like, maybe it would be helpful if it was a higher number, I don't know. But I think, you know, the question here is how useful do we think this is to help us understand kind of the health of the project versus um, if you were to look at say, uh, the quilt one, it says the contributors in the past year was three and the, um, no, wait, that was the, that was the Avalon one. Um, so the quilt one says contributors in the past year, one active contributors in the last six months, zero, right? That's, I think, the, the sort of thing that we're uh, looking at here is just to try and figure out with numbers, kind of the health of the project. Do we think the project reports are leading us astray? Um, that the, the maintainers are providing us, that sort of thing. That helped you? Yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, I think this is a, a very useful uh, dimension in terms of the contributors, uh, whether they're growing, maintaining, or dropping for a project that's sort of had, has been established. So we know, you know, are they maintaining their, their uh, act, uh, activeness? Um, but for new projects that are still trying to grow their contributors, I think this can be quite misleading. So I wonder where I, I, I'm thinking a new project is very actively in commit, but not necessarily in growing the contributors, because you know it's it's still the uh, core contributors that can understand the architecture. It's hard for for new uh, people to to jump in uh, just yet. So I wonder if we can also do PR and commit based uh, that I think can better reflect uh, new projects. I, I have uh, all of the yeah, projects. Ahead, uh, I have I have all of the projects uh, reports now. The the current ones. Which which one do you want me to bring up? Uh, I wonder if we look at, for example, uh, Bevel or uh, uh, Farfly, the two newest ones. We may see, yeah, so I think what this says is um, new contributors. And so I don't know how to interpret this, but it, it doesn't reflect that there, there are a hundred commits going on every week, you know, stuff like that, how active the project is even though the number of contributors is not growing necessarily. <clears throat> yeah, so I think, uh, Jim, any sort of GitHub APIs um, that are available could be included in this report as far yeah, as yeah. You know, we, if we yeah, need I to pull commits or uh, PRs or issues or things like that, right? Like, I, I think we can definitely include those. It's not a, it's not a major issue. Um, 
this is this code that's generating these reports is open source. It's a uh, it's part of the labs. Um, so if if we decide that you know there's anything that we want to add, we can definitely add to that. That'd be great. <clears throat> Any other thoughts on these project reports? Do we find them useful? Are they something that we'd like to you know see scheduled on a monthly basis so we can take a look at them uh, offline, not necessarily in the TSC call, but definitely offline just to see what's going on with projects and see if there's anything that uh, is stepping out or jumping out at us. Hart? Hey, Tracy. So I know the, the CNCF has like a really nice sort of like uh, update summary template, um, which has a lot of nice contributor statistics. I'm not sure that monthly is the right time period to look at things uh, just because um, there's so much flux just based on the month of the year. Like I'm sure, you know, December contributions are going to be much, much, much lower than other months or, or things like that. So it might be hard to read, you know, just monthly data, if that makes sense. Yeah, yep. And we can consider it doesn't make sense to run them on a quarterly basis to get um, the information or even run them uh, right before the project update is due to us. Um, you know, these are all sorts of things that we could discuss. Angela? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Tracy. I think in the same line of what Hart said, would it, would it be possible to have uh, a plot of the evolution of the projects over time, instead of having a snapshot of the, the a single month, because that will tell us the, about trends. Uh, so if it's growing overall, you know, we don't look at the peaks; we just look at the trends, which what we care about, I guess. Yep, uh, and I think you know the yeah insights tells us some of that. I think um, maybe we can pull you know some of this information into uh, our project updates as well. Uh, Peter. I also think it's a good idea as long as it's definitely fully automated so that no one has to prepare this report regularly by hand. And then the second part of what I wanted to say is that we could have additional metrics in there. Not 100% sure yet which ones, but we could come up with metrics that would serve as early indicators of dormancy. And I'm not saying that we should uh, put projects in dormancy based on the metrics. I'm just saying that this could also feed into that liaison appointment idea that I had. If we see that the numbers are going down or have gone down, like we could catch that hey, on this project has been no commits for the past three months. We need to appoint a liaison and, and send them over to the project and talk to them about what's happening. Yeah, definitely agree on the 100% automated. I don't want to manually have to do this um, as well. So, and I think that's, you know, some of the challenge that we have with the insights right now is that it is a manual process for somebody to go find the link and, um, you know, even if we were to try and copy this stuff from insights, it's still manual process to copy. So I definitely want to go with the, how can we automate, uh, what it is and yeah, if there's specific trends that people know about that will lend itself to, uh, Hey, something is starting to, to shift with this project and maybe we need to take a closer look. I think those are, um, things that, you know, let's bring up. And let's try and get them out here so we can take a look. Arno? Yeah, I just wanted to have a word of caution here. I mean, we don't want to go down the route of reinventing insights either, right? I mean, I'm sure. Agree, the trend would be nice, a graphic to show it would be nice, but. You know, it's a slippery slope before you know, everybody's going to say, oh, I would like this dimension, you know, and what about this and that? And then we are basically reinventing insights. Let's be careful not to go too far. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree, Arno. Um, we don't want to recreate the wheel. Um, there are so many tools out there right now that provide you with graphs and um, charts of 
the ways in which the open source stuff work. I think it was Artem right, who shared uh, even a new tool that I hadn't seen before. Um, what was it last week, a couple weeks ago? So 100% uh, agree, Arno. Bobby? Yes, thank you, Tracy. Um, I just wanted to point out that the Learning Materials Working Group captures this information for each one of the projects and tools. Um, every time the quarterly report comes out, I just put a link in the chat for an example for Firefly, but under uh, resources in the Learning Materials Working Group, all this information is captured by us. So just to let you know it's there. What? I, I wanted to uh, give everyone that's not aware of the context some, some uh, context here. This is a tool that uh, you know Tracy wrote, like I don't know, ten years ago, <laughs> and uh, we didn't have insights at that time. Yeah, you know, this 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 predates uh, a lot of the tools. So uh, you know, it's uh, pull requests would be great, but I also agree we shouldn't try to reinvent insights. So yeah. Yeah, definitely not 10 years ago, uh, but it, I mean, you know, I can't tell you how long ago it was. Um, it's been a while. It was when I was part of the Hyperledger staff, uh, trying to figure out kind of understanding our projects and, and that sort of thing. It just never, uh, never took off. Um, we, I think we were trying to create insights at that point. It felt like um, Brian wanted to, to really understand things. So, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I I think this is something that you know, if we find it useful, great. If we don't find it useful, that's fine too. Um, you know, it's out there. We can use it if we if we decide that that's what we want to do. Uh, okay. Um, so I know we only have four minutes left. Um, you know, we can continue kind of trying to figure out if there's specific metrics that might make sense to, to help us understand projects and, and where they're at. I, um, I think that I saw, yeah, it looks like Rahul has dropped and I'm sorry about that Arun for not catching your chat on that sooner. Um, we can definitely have Raul come maybe at the next TSC call and, and have a conversation about kind of the, the challenges that he's seeing with uh, working with other other projects, other communities in the Linux Foundation. Perfect. All right. Any, I informed him. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Arun. Um, any any other comments or uh, thoughts before we close out the meeting for today? Hey, Tracy. This is Grace. Hi, hey, Grace. Uh, just a. Um, I have wanted to give a quick update on the Discord proposal. Uh, is now a good time? Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Cool. Okay. Um, just for everyone's awareness, I'm going to send a note out to the TSC email, the task force for uh, the community chat. Uh, a group has put together a proposal for this group's review. So I uh, just wanted to give everyone a heads up that it's going to be sent out um, today and then hoping we can have a conversation at next week's TSC meeting. So just look look out for it in your email. Great, thanks Grace. We'll definitely include that on the agenda for next week. Uh, Jim? Yeah, thanks Tracy. Just a quick question. Uh, what would be a, the best place to like create a, a issue to track uh, to track all the stuff that we've been talking about for the for the data? So uh, yeah, we can probably maybe a GitHub the, issue somewhere. Yeah, we can probably add it to the TSC. Um, repo as an issue okay. and okay. start to capture that. Jim, Jim, did you want to, um, speaking of task forces, did you think it was useful to kick out of a task force to, to try and figure this out as a separate sort of group? Yeah, I feel like there, there are a few, a few clear directions that we, we can go into directly. Uh, so maybe we can self-organize and see if a, a task force uh, specific Tax force is, uh, is needed. Maybe we can start with a GitHub issue and, and see if we, if we can organize there. I, I'm happy to to help um, help you guys. You know, talking with um, inside team to see if they can 
to the enhancement, we asked for uh, something that came to mind as well is uh, doing exports uh, to images um, through APIs so things can be uh, more automa uh, automated. So stuff like that, I think we can we can put into the issue and then track it there. Uh, at the moment, don't know if we need a task force uh, right now. Okay, let's start with the issue and um, you know we can make sure that people are adding comments to that. Yeah, we'll post a link out to it. Yeah, if it's not working out, maybe we can. Uh, <laughs> we need to have meetings and get people to go attend meetings with as a task force. We'll Sounds see. good. Sounds cool. good. Thanks. All right. So with that, I am going to close the, the meeting for this week. Thank you all for the discussion. I think there's a lot of good things that are coming out, and I think we just have to follow up on uh, some of these things and take them over the finish line. So thanks all. all right. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Goodbye.